What does the number 12 mean in the Bible? What does the number 12 mean in the Bible? The number 12 in the Bible really draws a lot of attention because it pops up 189 times in the Bible. It mostly appears 26 times in 1 Chronicles, 22 times in the book of Revelation, and usually points to something significant. Number one, the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob, a key figure, had 12 sons. These sons became the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Genesis chapter 35, verses 20 through through 26. This isn't just a random family fact. It's significant because these tribes form the whole nation of Israel. The number 12 here represents a complete unified entity. Who are these 12 tribes of Israel? 12 tribes are more than just a family tree. It's a foundational element of the Bible, shaping the identity of God's people and weaving through the narrative of salvation history, from Abraham to Jesus, and even into the prophetic visions of the future. It's a story of promises made, identities formed, and destinies fulfilled. You might remember Jacob as the son of Isaac and grandson of Abraham. Jacob had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Zebulun, Issachar, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Joseph, and Benjamin. Each son became the head of a tribe, forming the 12 tribes of Israel. This is confirmed in Genesis chapter 49, verse 28, where it says, All these are the 12 tribes of Israel, and this is what their father said to them when he blessed them, giving each the blessing appropriate to him. Now, these tribes were critically important because they made up the nation of Israel. Imagine a puzzle with 12 big pieces. Each tribe is a piece, and together they create the complete picture of Israel. This setup was central to how people identified themselves and interacted with the nation. There's a twist in the story, though. In Numbers 1, you'll notice that the tribe of Levi isn't counted with the others. Why? Because the Levites were the priestly tribe, taking care of religious duties. They had a special role, as described in Numbers chapter 1, verses 47 through 50. The Levites, however, were not numbered among them by their father's tribe. In verse 48, For the Lord had said to Moses, Only the tribe of Levi you shall not number, nor shall you take their census among the sons of Israel, since they are unavailable to go to war. But appoint the Levites over the tabernacle, sanctuary of the testimony, and over all its furnishings and all things that belong to it. They shall carry the tabernacle when traveling, and all its furnishings, and they shall take care of it and camp around it. This is where God instructs Moses not to count Levi among the other tribes, but to assign them to take care of the tabernacle and its furnishings. This isn't because they were forgotten or less important. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The Levites had a special role. They weren't like the other tribes who were gearing up for battles or managing lands. Their job was unique. God set them apart for something different. They were like the caretakers and guardians of the tabernacle, which was the special tent where the Israelites worshipped God. Think of the Levites as the ultimate facilities and maintenance crew, but for a sacred place. Their job was to take care of the tabernacle and all the holy things inside it. They were like the new Adam and Eve figures, chosen by God to represent His presence and blessings to other tribes. It was a big responsibility and a huge honor. So, the Levites were counted separately because their job was different from the rest. They didn't fight in the army or own land like the other tribes. Instead, they had the sacred duty of looking after God's dwelling place. This set them apart, both in their duties and how they were counted. So, how does all this connect to Jesus? The Bible is particular about lineage and promises. Remember God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This promise finds its fulfillment in Jesus, who is from the tribe of Judah. Jesus' lineage is crucial because, through him, salvation is offered to everyone, fulfilling God's promise to bless all nations through Abraham's descendants. In the New Testament, Jesus is even referred to as the Lion of the tribe of Judah in Revelation chapter 5, verse 5, highlighting his royal and messianic lineage. This connection back to Judah, and by extension, to the twelve tribes emphasizes the continuity and fulfillment of God's promises throughout the Bible. 
The number 12 used for the tribes of Israel is not just a historical detail. It plays a significant role in biblical prophecy and identity. They were like the foundation stones of Israel, and each tribe had its part in shaping the history and destiny of God's people. For example, in Joshua chapter 7, verse 1, and 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 1 through 2, people's identities and stories are deeply intertwined with their tribal affiliation. Even in the New Testament, this tribal identity matters. The Apostle Paul, for instance, identifies himself as from the tribe of Benjamin in Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 5, showing that this lineage was still a big deal. Looking to the future, the tribes have a role in the end times prophecy. Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 through 4 talks about 144,000 people, 12,000 from each tribe, who will be sealed and spread the gospel during the Great Tribulation. This prophecy is like a full circle moment, linking the ancient tribes of Israel to God's ultimate plan of redemption. Number two, the 12 disciples. Jesus' decision to choose 12 men as his close associates wasn't random. It was loaded with meaning, especially for those who understood the history and traditions of Israel. Back in the day, the number 12 had significant weight in Jewish tradition, mainly because of the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember, these tribes were the foundation of the nation, representing the entire people of Israel. These disciples were the start of something new, a new Israel. This action alone was a powerful statement that echoed Jewish hopes for a renewed Israel, hopes that were central to their understanding of God's promises. In Matthew's Gospel, there's this writing style called chiasm. It's like when you say something and then later say it again but backward. Matthew uses this style to show how what Jesus does is similar to what he tells his apostles to do. For example, in Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, Jesus preaches and heals, seeing people in need like sheep without a shepherd. Then in Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 8, he sends out his apostles to do exactly the same things, preach and heal. The key point in this chiasm is Jesus choosing the 12 apostles and giving them authority. This authority is a big deal in Matthew's account of Jesus' life. The first chapters, Matthew chapters 1 through 9, are all about showing Jesus' authority, his royal lineage, fulfilling prophecies, his teachings, and his power over natural and supernatural forces. Then, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus shares this authority with his apostles. He essentially told them, When people receive you, they receive me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. It's like he's saying, you all are my representatives. How people treat you is how they're treating me. This concept extends to the apostolic succession, which is a fancy way of saying that the authority given to the original 12 apostles gets passed down through generations. In the Catholic Church, for instance, they see bishops as successors of the apostles. This shows that by listening to these leaders, you're following Jesus' teachings, just like you would have if you were listening to the original 12 apostles. And he appointed 12 disciples so that they would be with him for instruction and so that he could send them out to preach, the gospel as apostles, that is, as his special messengers, personally chosen representatives, and to have authority and power to cast out demons. He appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to them, he gave them the name Bonerges, that is, sons of thunder. And he also appointed Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, Nathaniel, and Matthew, Levi, the tax collector, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Judas, the son of James, and Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Matthew chapter 3, verses 14 through 19. By picking 12, Jesus was echoing that Old Testament theme of completeness and authority. Even after one disciple, Judas betrayed Jesus and was replaced. They made sure to get back to 12 by adding Matthias. Acts chapter 1 verse 26. This highlights how important it was for the group to reflect that complete, authoritative number. So why 12? Jesus was making a statement. By choosing 12 apostles, he was symbolizing the formation of a new Israel, centered around himself. These 12 men were the foundational leaders of this new spiritual Israel. He was reconstituting God's people, not based on ethnicity or geography, but based on faith in him and his teachings. This decision of Jesus wasn't just about picking a team. It was a strategic and significant move. 
signaling a new chapter in God's plan. The twelve apostles represented a new beginning, a renewal of God's promise to His people. They were the starting lineup for a new kind of Israel, a community defined by faith in Jesus and commitment to spreading His message. In short, Jesus choosing twelve disciples was a masterstroke. It connected His mission to Israel's history, signaled the start of a new spiritual Israel, and set the stage for the spreading of His teachings. Plus, it showed that Jesus was serious about sharing His authority and mission with others. In all these instances, whether it's the twelve tribes, twelve disciples, or the twelve years of suffering, the number twelve serves as a symbol of something that's complete and has a kind of authority or significance. It's like a thread that weaves through the Bible, tying together different stories and ideas into a larger coherent tapestry. So, when you spot the number twelve in the Bible, think of it as a little nudge to pay attention. It's often there to highlight something important, complete, or authoritative, shaping how we understand the bigger picture of God's story and plan. The Twelve Gates of Heaven First off, these gates are part of the New Jerusalem, a magnificent city described in the book of Revelation as coming down from heaven to a new earth. It's a place shining with God's glory. The city has a great high wall with twelve gates, each guarded by an angel and inscribed with the names of the twelve tribes of Israel. Revelation chapter 21, verse 12. Each gate is made from a single pearl, and these gates are never shut. Revelation chapter 21, verse 25. Now, why twelve gates, and why the names of the twelve tribes of Israel? To get this, we need to go way back to Abraham. God promised him a great nation, and his grandson Jacob, later named Israel, had twelve sons who became the heads of the twelve tribes of Israel. Genesis chapter 49. In Jerusalem, during King David's time, God chose this city as his resting place. 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 13. Fast forward to Revelation, and there's this new heavenly Jerusalem, representing the reign of Jesus the Lamb. This city's foundation represents the twelve apostles. Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, linking the Old Testament, the tribes, and the New Testament, the apostles. The gates are arranged perfectly. Three on each side of the city. Revelation chapter 21, verse 13. Each gate has the name of one of Israel's tribes, like a tribute to the patriarchs. But it's not just about Israel. It's about all of God's people from every era. Physical versus spiritual descendants of Abraham. Romans 9 talks about the difference between being a physical descendant of Abraham and being a spiritual descendant. That is, anyone who has faith in God like Abraham did. It's not just about bloodline, it's about faith. True Israel, according to the New Testament, includes everyone who trusts in Jesus, both Jews and Gentiles. There's also this cool comparison with the city in Ezekiel's vision, which also has gates named after Israel's tribes. Ezekiel chapter 48, verses 30 through 34. It's like these visions are connected, showing a consistent plan of God throughout history. Most importantly, angels guard the these gates, just like an angel guarded Eden after Adam and Eve left in Genesis. And nothing that defiles or profanes or is unwashed will ever enter it, nor anyone who practices abominations, detestable, morally repugnant things, and lying, but only those will be admitted whose names have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Revelation chapter 21 verse 27. Each gate being a single pearl is fascinating. Pearls were super valuable back then. And this mention is like saying the New Jerusalem is priceless. It's the ultimate treasure, something Jesus talked about in his parable of the pearl of great price. Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 through 46. This city is worth everything. The fact that the gates never close means there's always safety and peace. It's like an open invitation to everyone, from all directions, to experience God's grace. It's a picture of eternal accessibility to God's kingdom where the glory and honor of the nations will be brought in. Revelation chapter 21, verse 26. The 144,000. In Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, John, the writer of Revelation, describes seeing four angels at the earth's corners, holding back destructive winds. Then, another angel arrives with the seal of the living God and instructs not to harm the earth until God's servants are sealed on their foreheads. This sealing is a sign of God's protection. John then hears the number of those sealed, 144,000 from the tribes of Israel. 
with 12,000 from each tribe. How is the number 144,000 connected to the number 12? Basically, you take 12, representing completeness, square it, which is 144, and then multiply it by 1,000, a number often used in the Bible to signify a large, complete multitude. So, 144,000 sort of screams complete perfection in biblical numerology. But why use this kind of math? In the Bible, numbers aren't just numbers. They tell a story, convey a message. When you see 144,000 in Revelation, it's like a coded message saying, this is the complete perfected gathering of God's people. It's not necessarily about the literal number, but about what the number represents. It's interesting how these numbers intertwine. How do they both point towards something whole, complete and divinely perfect? The number 12 lays the foundation and 144,000 builds on it, expanding the idea to a grand heavenly scale. So when we read about 144,000 in Revelation, it's not just about counting heads. It's about understanding the completeness and perfection of God's plan for his people. It's like asking, are we part of this complete, perfected group? Are we contributing to the wholeness of God's kingdom? It's a symbolic way of looking at our place in God's grand story. Where does this appear in the Bible? The 144,000 are mentioned in the book of Revelation, which is known for its importance in apocalyptic revelation. They first appeared in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, where John writes, Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of the children of Israel. Later, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 1, John sees them again with the Lamb, Jesus, on Mount Zion. What will be their mission? The mission of the 144,000 is closely tied to the end times, a period of tribulation. These individuals are described as being sealed by God, which suggests they are protected for a special purpose. In Revelation chapter 14, verses 3 through 4, they are described as those who had been redeemed from the earth and who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. This implies a mission of faithful witness and service during challenging times. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, people will come to life and reign with Christ for a thousand years. This is often understood as the martyrs and those who have remained faithful to Jesus, refusing to worship the beast or receive his mark. The connection between these individuals and the 144,000 is a matter of debate among scholars and theologians. Some see them as the same, while others view them as distinct groups. And I heard how many were sealed, 144,000, 12,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Revelation chapter 7, verses 3 through 4. The 144,000 are described as being sealed on their foreheads. The seal is often interpreted as a sign of God's protection over them during the tribulations that will occur in the end times. It's like a divine safeguard against the disaster and challenges of that period. The confusion people have. There's quite a bit of confusion in various interpretations about the 144,000. Some of this comes from the nature of revelation and the challenge of understanding the apocalyptic literature. Are the 144,000 literal or representational? Are they a specific ethnic group or representing a broader spiritual community? One common view is that the 144,000 are literal descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel, chosen for a special purpose in the end times. Another interpretation sees them more symbolically, representing the complete faithful church, a spiritual Israel. The precise identity and role of the 144,000 can be a bit baffling, and different Christian denominations and theologians offer various takes. Some groups have claimed exclusive identity as the 144,000, but such claims are often met with skepticism and critique based on broader theological and biblical analysis. With all this, what does the Bible say about who they are? 12,000 were sealed from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 from the tribe of Gad, 12,000 from the tribe of Asher, 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi, 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 from the tribe of Joseph, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin were sealed, marked, 
redeemed, protected. After these things I looked, and this is what I saw, a vast multitude which no one could count, gathered from every nation and from all the tribes and peoples and languages of the earth, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, Christ, dressed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. Ten, and in a loud voice they cried out, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne. And to the Lamb, our salvation is the Trinity's to give. And to God, the Trinity, we owe our deliverance. Revelation chapter 7, verses 5 through 10. This verse lists the 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, with 12,000 from each tribe. Then in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, there's a shift. John says, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. So, we've got two groups here the 144,000 from the tribes of Israel, and this vast, uncountable multitude from all over the world. This leads to a big question. Does this mean only the 144,000 will make it to heaven? The key is to understand that the book of Revelation is full of visions. It's like a grand painting, using vibrant and dramatic descriptions to convey deep truths. The number 144,000 is not necessarily about a literal headcount, but as mentioned earlier, it's a complete perfect number, representing the whole of God's people. The great multitude. This isn't just about Israel. It's about people from every corner of the earth. They're all standing before God, united in their diversity. It's a powerful image of inclusivity and universality. In other words, Revelation isn't saying that only 144,000 people get into heaven. Instead, it's using the number 144,000 to represent the complete, whole community of God's people, symbolizing perfection and completeness. Then, the great multitude expands on this idea, showing that heaven is not exclusive to a certain group, but open to all who follow God from every nation and background. Understanding the 144,000 like much of Revelation, requires a balance of taking the Bible seriously, but also recognizing the genre and style of apocalyptic literature. It's about faith, commitment, and God's sovereignty, even in the most turbulent times. Whether we see the 144,000 as a literal number or a representation, their depiction challenges us to consider the depth of our own faithfulness in the face of trials. So, the takeaway Heaven is not about an exclusive club with limited membership. It's about a vast, diverse community of believers from all over the world, united in their faith and standing together before God. It's a message of hope and inclusivity, telling us that heaven's doors are open to all who believe, regardless of where they come from. How wonderful it is to be counted among God's flock, to be part of an army that advocates peace and love through Jesus Christ. Isn't it incredible to think that, despite our flaws, we can be marked by God's grace and mercy? The story of the 144,000, whether literal or symbolic, reminds us of God's sovereignty and the importance of faithfulness. It invites us to consider our own place in God's grand narrative. Are we living as part of this symbolic army of peacemakers and faithful followers? Other Occurrences of the Number 12 Miraculous healing of a woman bleeding for 12 years in Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 through 22. These 12 years represented a long period of suffering that came to a complete and miraculous end, highlighting the power and compassion of Jesus. Twelve unleavened cakes at the tabernacle in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 5. In the tabernacle, 12 cakes were set out, symbolizing the presence and provision of God for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. It was like a significant meal showing that God sustains all His people. Twelve baskets of leftovers in Matthew chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. After Jesus fed a huge crowd with just five loaves and two fish, there were twelve baskets of leftovers. This miracle not only shows Jesus' power to provide, but also the twelve baskets represent abundance for each of the twelve tribes, an overflow of blessing. Twelve spies explored the promised land. Numbers 13. Moses sent twelve spies to scope out the promised land, one from each tribe. This mission represents the complete representation of Israel, each tribe participating in the exploration of their future home. 
Solomon appointed 12 governors. 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 26. King Solomon set up 12 districts with a governor for each to manage resources and provide for the kingdom. This organization shows a structured and balanced approach to governance with each part of the kingdom properly cared for. Ezra selects 12 priests. Ezra chapter 8, verse 24. When returning to Jerusalem, Ezra chose 12 priests for an important task, reflecting the idea of the 12 tribes and the importance of religious leadership and responsibility. The tree of life will bear 12 fruits. Revelations chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. In John's vision in Revelation, which symbolizes ongoing life and sustenance, with each fruit representing continuous provision and life for God's people. Twelve minor prophets in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has twelve minor prophets, each with their unique message, but together forming a complete picture of God's communication and expectations for His people. The twelve curses for disobedience in Israel. Deuteronomy chapter 27. In a stark warning to Israel, Twelve curses are listed for disobedience. These curses represent the full consequences of turning away from God's commandments. Twelve wells of water at Elam. Exodus chapter 15, verse 27. After leaving Egypt, the Israelites find twelve wells at Elam, symbolizing God's provision and refreshment for each tribe in a time of need. Elijah built an altar with twelve stones. 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 31 through 32. Prophet Elijah used 12 stones, representing the tribes of Israel, to rebuild the altar of the Lord. It was a symbol of unity and recommitment of the divided kingdom to God. In each of these instances, the number 12 isn't just a random figure. It carries with it a sense of wholeness, authority, and God's orderly provision. Whether it's in the healing of a woman, the miraculous feeding of a multitude, the organization of a kingdom, or the representation of the tribes in various ways. The number 12 threads through these stories as a sign of completeness and divine order. This reoccurrence of 12 in various contexts emphasizes its significance. It's like a repeated note in a symphony, each time played in a different way but always contributing to the overall harmony and message of God's interaction with His people. Whether it's about governance, provision, prophecy, or judgment, the number 12 in the Bible speaks to the idea of God's perfect arrangement and care in all aspects of life and faith. Application Today Think of how our daily lives are structured around systems and institutions. For instance, there are 12 months in a year, which is a fundamental aspect of our timekeeping and organization of life. In the Bible, this idea of organization is mirrored in the 12 tribes of Israel, Genesis chapter 49, verse 28, which were central to the structure and governance of the Israelite society. God's perfection and healing. Then there's the aspect of God's perfection and healing associated with the number 12. In today's world, we often seek balance and perfection in various aspects of life, be it personal development, health, or spirituality. This quest for balance and wholeness can be seen as a reflection of the biblical representation of 12. For instance, Jesus' healing of the woman who bled for 12 years, Luke chapter 8, verses 43 through 48, is a powerful example of restoration and healing. Hebrew tradition. The number 12 is also seen as prophetic in Hebrew tradition. In contemporary terms, this could be interpreted as looking towards the future with hope and expectation. It's about believing that, despite the challenges, a higher power has a plan for order and good governance in the world. God's control. Lastly, the idea of God in control associated with 12 is quite comforting, especially in today's fast-paced and often uncertain world. It's a reminder that in the midst of the chaos and unpredictability of life, there's a divine order and purpose. This concept is beautifully illustrated in Revelation chapter 21, verses 12 through 14, where the New Testament has 12 gates and 12 foundations, symbolizing God's ultimate control and the perfection of His divine plan. In conclusion, the number 12 from a biblical perspective offers us a framework for understanding our world. It speaks of order, healing, hope, and divine control concepts that are as relevant today as they were in ancient times, whether it's in the structure of our calendars, our quest for personal and societal perfection, or our hope for the future. 
The symbolism of 12 offers both comfort and direction. The number 12 is a very fascinating number. Think of it as a significance for perfection, power, authority, or completeness, serving as a perfect governmental foundation. This idea of perfection isn't about being flawless, but more about representing something that is complete and whole. Let's start with the Old Testament. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather today in reverence, reflecting on the significance of the number 12 in your holy word. As we delve into the depths of its meaning, let our hearts and minds be open to the divine wisdom it imparts. Lord, we recognize the number 12 as a significance of your perfect governance and divine authority. Just as there were 12 tribes of Israel chosen to lead and guide your people, we pray for guidance in our own lives. Help us to navigate our paths with the wisdom and strength that comes from you alone. In the 12 tribes, we see a representation of your chosen people, a testament to your faithfulness and love. We ask that you instill in us a sense of belonging and purpose, reminding us that we, too, are chosen and loved by you. May we feel your presence in our daily lives, guiding us towards fulfilling our destinies. As we reflect on the 12 apostles chosen by Jesus to spread your word and love, inspire us to be messengers of your gospel. Grant us the courage to share your teachings and the love of Christ with those around us. May we be a channel of your light in a world that often dwells in darkness. Lord, the 12 baskets of leftovers after Jesus fed the 5,000 remind us of your abundant provision. In times of need, remind us that you are the God of more than enough. Teach us to trust in your provision, knowing that you will always supply your needs according to your riches and glory. As we consider the heavenly Jerusalem, with its 12 gates and 12 foundations, let us be filled with hope and anticipation for your kingdom. We long for the day when we will walk streets of gold, surrounded by your glory. Until that day, help us to live in a manner worthy of the calling you have placed on our lives. In the life of Jesus, we see the significance of the age of 12, as he was found in the temple, engaging with teachers and displaying wisdom beyond his years. Lord, grant us a portion of that wisdom. Help us to seek your face in all matters, to grow in understanding and maturity, just as Jesus did. We pray for unity among believers, just as the 12 stones on the high priest's breastplate represented the tribes of Israel, unified in purpose and calling. May your church today be united in Christ, standing together in faith and love, reflecting your glory to the world. Remind us that we are under your watchful eye, guarded and guided by your hand. In times of trial and tribulation, let this be our comfort and our strength. As we reflect on the significance of the number 12, let it be a reminder of your perfect order and completeness. May it inspire us to seek completeness in you, finding our purpose and fulfillment in your will. Lord, please help those who don't know you yet. Let the truth in your teachings, shown through these 12 important points, touch their hearts. Help them see how much you love them and the salvation you offer, and bring them into your eternal family. Finally, we pray for ourselves that we may practice the principles represented by the number 12. Grant us the strength to lead like the tribes of Israel, the faith to preach like the apostles, the trust to rely on your provision, and the hope of your eternal kingdom. In all things we give you thanks and praise, for you are our God, and your love endures forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.